Bonjour à tous, bienvenue à la quatrième édition des entrevues Code V. Welcome everybody to the Code Life Interviews Part 4 of our series of panels marking the Montreal General Hospital's 200th anniversary. Happy to see you in 2022. And, uh, You know, today we're going to be putting a spotlight on the mental health mission at the MUHC and at the Montreal General Hospital. And it was in the direct aftermath of World War II actually that it started. Uh, this highlighted the psychiatric needs in the general population. Uh, and it was then that modern psychiatric treatment began at the Montreal General Hospital. Aujourd'hui, fast forward to 2022, uh, la mission en santé mentale du CUSUM comporte des équipes qui sont multidisciplinaires en psychologie, en psychiatrie. It offers specialized emergency and acute care, of course, but it also serves as a liaison with all kinds of other resources in the community. So joining us uh, to uh, talk about uh, everything that's happening there and also what the future holds is Dr. Karine Iguartua, the newly appointed psychiatrist in chief at the MUHC, so congratulations uh, on the new job. Um, we also have Dr. Howard Margulies, who is the research co-director of the, uh, the MUHC Mental Health Mission, uh, also the director of many programs, including uh, the Prevention and Early Intervention for Psychosis program at the MUHC. And uh, Marise Godin, aussi coordinatrice clinico-administrative, est avec nous. Uh, elle fait ça au département d'urgence euh, de la mission en santé mentale euh, du CUSUM. Alors, euh, vous êtes un petit peu au, au cœur, au front, euh, surtout ces jours-ci. Alors, you know, of course, it seems very timely to be talking about mental health right now, especially in this, con this COVID context. Uh, January is also uh, uh, Mental Health and Mental Health uh, Awareness Month, rather. So uh, let, let's start with Dr. Uh, Igor Chua, getting straight to you. Um, There's an important distinction for you to make between, we're talking a lot about mental health and wellness and about mental illness. So, so why is that important? Why is it important to distinguish those two things? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because I think we, um, you know, there's been a work to destigmatize um, mental illness, but I think it's still a relic of the stigmatization that we tend to use the word mental health as a euphemism for mental illness. You know, we all have levels of health, If we talk about physical health, then we can talk about having the strength, the muscle strength, the, the strength in our bones to be able to carry us through the day, having the digestive strength to be able to you know, eat and get what we need in terms of nutrients for strength, having the cardiovascular strength to have the oxygen and the energy, you know, and th that sort of physical health. If we're talking about mental health, we're talking about having the resiliency to face life's day-to-day -day challenges, to be able to self-regulate when we have different emotional states, uh, to be able to have the creativity and the bandwidth to face different um, stressors or different problems during our day. And so we all have a level of mental health and physical health all the time. That doesn't mean that we have a mental illness. When we're talking about mental illness, you know, we're talking about depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, Um, bipolar disorder, the same way we wouldn't talk about digestive health or digestive harmony, we would talk about Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis right. or something like that. So I think there is a distinction to be made between mental health, which we all have a certain level of, and we can talk about how that has maybe changed over time and with COVID, um, and mental illness, which is, you know, a st which is a, a different concept. Mm -hmm. and, and what you, what you do at, at the MGH and, and, and at the MUHC, but uh, do you feel that, you know, with all this talk and this raised awareness about mental health, do you, do you feel though that the line is getting blurred a little bit more between those two concepts, uh, especially in this context? Yeah, I think with this context, particularly of the restrictions and COVID and people have lost jobs and people have lost social contacts and, and they've lost their, their um, schedules and, and what they do for fun. Uh, a lot of people have found their mental health has dropped. Eh? We were talking about languishing as something that, that is happening right now. People are just, they're not thriving, they're languishing. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of people are feeling more distressed. It doesn't mean that they have a mental illness per se, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that line is getting blurred because the level of distress in society as a whole mm -hmm. is, is increased in this stressful time. Okay, and, and we were just talking about before going, uh, going live that Madame Godin, Marise Godin, vous, vous êtes un peu, vous êtes au, je disais un peu au front, au cœur des opérations. Vous, euh, comment est-ce que ça affecte vos opérations à tous les jours quand euh, vous vous référez des patients ou vous avez des appels des patients avec les différentes équipes? Comment est-ce que vous vivez ça? 
On a, on a eu beaucoup plus de gens qui, se sont, qui, qui ont cherché à consulter justement parce qu'ils étaient en détresse et ils se questionnent « est-ce que j'ai eu une maladie mentale ou, ou la crainte de développer une maladie mentale? » Puis il y a aussi, que, il y a, comme, comme Dr Gertrude a mentionné, la santé mentale, on sait mal comment s'en occuper. On n'en parle pas beaucoup, on sait quoi faire pour s'occuper de notre santé physique. Mais bien qu'on, c'est dans le discours très populaire maintenant de parler de santé mentale, mais comment on fait pour se bâtir une santé mentale qui est solide, la majorité des gens n'ont pas vraiment de repères pour ça. Et il y, y a cette crainte aussi que est-ce qu'on va chroniciser certaines, certaines émotions que les gens ressentent et, et est-ce qu'ils vont de, développer des troubles anxieux permanents, on ne le sait pas encore, je pense qu'on va le savoir dans une couple d'années, il est trop tôt. Mm -hmm. euh, mais certainement, il y, y a ça qu'on a vu plus. D'un autre côté, on a aussi vu nos clientèles très, très vulnérables qui souffrent de maladies mentales s'isoler encore plus. Okay. Euh, parce que le très peu de réseaux qu'ils avaient est disparu, parce qu'ils avaient peur de sortir de chez eux. Alors, on a eu à faire beaucoup d'essayer de, de, de connecter avec ces gens-là de façon différente, surtout en début de pandémie. Là, on, on semble avoir pris un certain rythme euh, pour garder nos patients les plus vulnérables connectés à nos équipes cliniques. Euh, mais certainement, je pense que c'est ça qu'on a vu le plus. Là, en, terme, en, première, en première année que je pense à l'urgence psychiatrique, là, le nombre de patients qui se présentent, pas nécessairement parce qu'ils ils sont en psychose ou ils ont une maladie mentale, mais qui ne savent pas quoi faire avec les émotions là, qui, qui, qui viennent les chercher, qui ne sont pas capables de dormir, qui justement avaient tout un réseau qui les supportait, puis là, ils se retrouvent complètement seuls. Mm -hmm. And, and I just want to jump quickly to, to Dr. Gortor. You were saying you, you were you, you've I'm been giving out diagnosis. <laughs> diagnosis. <laughs> the, you know, often my diagno my main diagnosis is loneliness. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I have to tell people, I said, this is what you're suffering from. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't give you a pill for loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning of the pandemic, I actually hospitalized a lady for a few days with the agreement that it would allow her to see a couple of nurses face to face. Wow. And, and that was sort of, we made that agreement that because she was so lonely and mm -hmm. she so needed to see someone, I kept her for two days just, just so she could see somebody. Uh, and that's, that's really sad because that's not yeah. what our hospital should be for. Mm -hmm. uh, but that sort of gives you an indication of how severe the loneliness is sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the work that you're doing is, is just more um, necessary and more important than ever on so many fronts. And, and one of them is, you know, specialized care, uh, acute care, a big part of um, what you're doing um, with the mental health mission and, and Dr. Margulies, I want to know, um, you know, what does that look like in your specialty, which is early intervention for, for psychosis? Um, tell us a little bit about, about what you do uh, in, the, in the PET. Yeah, so the, the PET program is one of uh, many programs, similar programs that we have in the province of Quebec. Um, it was modeled after the Australian uh, model for providing early access and early intervention for young people suffering from a first episode of psychosis. So um, the concept is that people who uh, are developing a psychotic process would get treated right away with um, good intervention, a high quality care, and with a dedicated team to help them navigate that process. And uh, we've seen very amazing success stories with this program. I, I can think of one young man who um, was literally on the streets when we first met him. And, um, and you know, we were really uncertain what would happen to him and where he would go. And it took quite some time to, to develop an alliance with him. And after that, that initial process, he agreed to, to the treatment and to continue with us. And now he's actually working as an ambulance technician. Okay. So just to so show you how he turned his entire life around um, through the help of our program. So that, that kind of success story to me Um, makes me feel that, that the work I do every day is both meaningful and valuable. Mm -hmm. and, and psychosis is not, is very different than what we're talking about when we talk about people who are lonely or languishing, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and this, is a, this is an illness for which really um, good psychiatric care is required. Okay. And, and you know, you, we, one of the other things that you're, you're doing uh, as research uh, co-director, and, and if we're talking a little, a little bit more about research and innovation, which is obviously a big part of what you're doing in the, in the mental health mission, is, um, you know, to, to better understand mental illness so that you can better serve uh, patients. And, um, and this brings us to the MGH uh, Center for Precision Psychiatry. So tell us a little bit about, about that, because that's quite innovative and exciting. 
Um, yeah, I'm really happy you brought up this, this point that we're, we're, as a department, very excited about mm -hmm. this project. Um, and I would venture to say it's probably the largest and most comprehensive research project that our department has ever undertaken. Okay. And what it is, is a, uh, a 10, uh, actually a 15 year project that we're launching just this month. And um, we are going to collect longitudinal data uh, on uh, many patients cross diagnoses, so many different diagnoses, and follow them over a period of 10 years with uh, hopefully follow-ups every two years and really get a better understanding of the trajectories of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Because if we can understand how people navigate their illnesses through their lifespan and understand the trajectories of mental illness, we can then develop better treatments early on that may change those trajectories. Mm -hmm. And, and would it be possible to, to catch certain signs, um, you know, early to try to, to, to prevent the trajectories that we're seeing? Like, t tell that us would be how, the holy grail. That yeah. would be the ultimate, eh? If we, could, if we could figure out what would be some of those markers and some of those early warning signs of mental illness and intervene even before or as it's starting, that would be, of course, the, the, the ideal in order to, to change those trajectories. I mean, we kind of do that in the PEP program a little bit. Um, you know, I've often thought that in all of our illnesses, one of the biggest factors in whether people do well or poorly is the number of episodes that they have. And you can see that for, this is true for depression and for bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, psychosis. If you have fewer episodes, you tend, on average, to do better over your lifespan. If you have multiple episodes, that's when the illness gets more difficult to treat, more chronicized. Mm -hmm. and yeah, go ahead. And there's more um, functional impairment too. Mm -hmm. The more times you, every, with every episode, you lose something. And so the more yeah. episodes you have, the more you lose socially, financially, relationship-wise, cognitively even. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, is there any sort of patients or, or situations that you can think of where you thought, oh, I wish I, I had this piece of data or I wish I had, and, and how it could have changed uh, the, their outcomes? Yeah, you know, you know, I think that, um, that, that sometimes I'll see people who, you know, are not at the very beginning of their illness, mm -hmm. but have been ill for quite some time. And I often think, hmm, if I only could have seen them a year ago or two years ago, uh, what could I have done then to prevent what I'm seeing now? I, I do think that. And, and it's, it's sometimes, the, you know, uh, through how they, how they got into the system that, that is the delay and they're getting treatment by, you know, by a, by a psychiatrist, by our teams. Um, and sometimes it just has to do with the fact that they didn't want the treatment at that time. You know, sometimes we have to remember that part of our, our, our mission is also to um, provide the right care for the right patient at the right time. And, you know, I think that the Center for Precision Psychiatry is going to help us to hone in on how to do this in a better way, more efficiently. And, and quick, well, one, one last question on this, because you know, the, the goal is ambitious to eventually to, to share, to, to sort of connect the different um, hospitals, the neuro, for instance, and, and share the data through open science, right? I mean, this is something you're hoping so many more people will be able to, to benefit from. Yeah, our hope is we're not, we're not planning to sort of hoard the data for ourselves. <laughs> the, the idea is exactly that, to, to, to eventually be able to create this, this large data bank uh, in order to allow an, our, ourselves as researchers, but also researchers from uh, other institutions and, and other departments at McGill and other institutions in the world to maybe even um, share the data and see, you know, and be able to use multiple databases to better understand uh, the trajectories of, of illness. Oui, puis pour, pour vous, comme, comme, comme chef maintenant de la mission, quel potentiel est-ce que vous voyez quand, quand on parle de ce, ce projet-là? Je veux dire, les impacts pourraient être énormes là, sur d'autres cliniques, puis tu sais, on, on pense encore plus loin et plus loin que le, que, que le CUSUM aussi. Là. Ouais, je vais vous parler pas tellement comme chef de mission, mais plutôt comme clinicienne aussi, mm -hmm. qui travaille dans un, un autre créneau, à part travailler à l'urgence psychiatrique. Euh, J'ai cofondé euh, le Centre d'identité sexuelle de l'Université McGill, qui a maintenant 20 ans. Euh, et euh, dans ce contexte-là, je vois des patients qui viennent de minorités sexuelles et dans, la, je dirais dans les dix dernières années, des patients qui questionnent leur identité de genre et beaucoup de jeunes aussi, mm -hmm. qui m'arrivent avec leurs parents et qui me disent « Ok, mon jeune veut transitionner, euh, il a été assigné garçon à la naissance, il veut devenir une fille. » Et les parents me demandent euh, 
Comment est-ce que je sais qu'il ne changera pas d'idée dans un an ou dans deux ans? Et je suis obligée de répondre scientifiquement, je n'ai pas de réponse. Je n'ai pas de réponse pour vous parce que cette population-là, n'a pas, on n'a pas de données longitudinales sur cette population-là. Donc, moi, je suis très excitée de pouvoir offrir à mes patients de faire partie de l'histoire avec, avec ce, ce projet-là, euh, d'avoir des données sur 10 ans sur, euh, sur ces patients-là, avec non seulement des, des, des données euh, au niveau des questionnaires et des choses comme ça, mais des données biologiques aussi. Il va y avoir des prises de sang, il va y avoir de l'imagerie. Donc, c'est vraiment un, un suivi complet euh, de patients de, dif pardon, de différents diagnostics. Et pour moi, cliniquement, j'ai une population pour laquelle ces données-là n'existent tout simplement pas. Mm. Donc, moi, je suis très, très, très excitée pour, pour ce projet-là, en particulier pour ma clinique, mais c'est sûr que tous les départements, bon, pour, pour Howard, c'est pour les psychoses, mais on a les troubles de l'humeur, on a les troubles anxieux, ça, ça va vraiment pouvoir... Euh, nous donner des réponses dans, dans tous les créneaux. Il y, y a tellement à explorer en santé mentale. On, on, a, on a très peu de réponses, finalement, là, pour, plusieurs, pour plusieurs situations. Et pour, pour vous, Marie Godin, qu'est-ce que ça. C'est quelque chose que vous avez dit. C'est oui. excitant là, avoir oui. pouvoir un jour mesurer les trajectoires, pouvoir voir qu'est-ce qui. C'est mesurer les trajectoires, mais c'est aussi qu'est-ce qu'on va faire avec cette information-là en bout de ligne. Mm -hmm. euh, moi, j'ai dit, je suis arrivée à la santé mentale un peu tard dans ma carrière. Je viens de la santé physique où depuis des années, on sait, que ce soit les maladies cardiaques ou autres, on, on sait quels sont les, les signes euh, avant-coureurs. On sait quoi faire tôt dans les maladies pour s'assurer que les gens ne développent pas mm -hmm. euh, des problèmes complexe. On sait comment encadrer aussi, non seulement le patient, mais la famille, pour que tout le monde se soutienne, pour que tout le monde soit capable de participer au traitement et, et surveille aussi les symptômes et, et, et comment la maladie progresse. Et, et on, peut, on, on peut enseigner aux gens comment, euh, bon, vous devez planifier ça, vous devez penser à ça, voici ce qui peut vous arriver ici. Alors moi, je trouve ça très excitant parce que quand je suis arrivée en santé mentale, c'était le flou euh, qui, 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 qui m'a surpris parce que on ne sait pas souvent, les gens nous arrivent tard dans leur diagnostic. Justement, ils ont fait plusieurs épisodes avant de réaliser que non, ce n'est pas parce que, parce que je suis faible d'esprit ou parce que je suis pas assez forte dans la vie, mais c'est vraiment une maladie mentale qui, qui peut être traitée. Euh, où, où on peut aussi dire à, à la personne, « Bon, ben voici ce qui va vous arriver dans 5 ans, dans 10 ans, dans 20 ans. » Si vous suivez le traitement, si vous ne le suivez pas, d'engager les familles aussi, parce que souvent, les, les patients les plus, les plus difficiles ou les plus affectés en santé mentale, à un moment donné, les familles s'épuisent et, et disparaissent. Oui. Et, et ça, ça devient très difficile. Pour ces gens-là, ils n'ont aucun soutien. Mais je me dis toujours, si on était capable de les prendre plus tôt puis de focusser non seulement sur le patient, mais sur la famille aussi, puis le réseau social. Dire, voici comment on soutient, voici comment on accompagne les gens dans leur maladie. Euh, pour moi, ça, c'est superbement excitant. Et, et je pense, justement, le programme de premier épisode de psychose, où il y a beaucoup de jeunes, euh, c'est ce que les, les infirmières, mais aussi les autres intervenants de l'équipe multidisciplinaire disent. Dans ces équipes-là, ils sont capables de non seulement suivre le patient, mais aussi de donner des conseils à la famille pour que, pour que, pour que la bulle n'éclate pas. Ouais. Alors Comme ça, c'est très excitant. Souvent, quand on se rend à vous, il est tard. Là. Il, 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 la famille est épuisée. Ouais. Ouais. I, I just want to add that we do know some things that can yes. already help people mm. to reduce the risk of, of mm. mental illness. Um, and and we, should, we should be mindful of these, of these important points. It's obviously, it's, uh, uh, obviously, it's a reduction and obviously no, uh, if possible, substance use. Cannabis use specifically has a link to psychosis mm. and onset of psychotic disorders. Um, we know that... Uh, Um, things like exercise um, can promote good mental health and, and, and uh, release positive brain hormones in order to, to reduce risk of certain mental illnesses. So there are things that people can do already to help their mental, mental health. Um, but uh, when, we see, when we see young folks, we, we address not only their, so we address not only them uh, you know, from a medication or pharmacology point of view, we address our patients in a holistic approach. And that's what I think is really important in, in our department is we see them as an individual and we look at all aspects of their lives to try and help them navigate these illnesses. And, and to do so, you have to really do so on a daily basis, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if you, if you have someone who has diabetes, they have to take care of their physical yeah. and their mental health on a daily basis. And we, we see our patients this way in a holistic approach, uh, including, of course, the, 
the families uh, as an important component of, of helping, especially our young folks with the first episode. Mm -hmm. And the families discovering all kinds of things about themselves too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, but, yeah. But, um, Dr. Iguarta, I, I, Iguarta I, just, I just want to ask you, um, you know, you're, you're very new to the position, um, but, but tell me a little bit, is this, where's your vision, what's your vision for uh, the mental health mission? Is it um, sort of better, working on better predicting trajectories? Is it involving the families? Where do you hope to, to take things this, uh, at this early stage? It's a big question. <laughs> it's a big question, and, and I'm not going to build the vision by myself. Mm -hmm. I think there's a whole team of people. Um, you know, I'm new as a chief, but I've been in the department for 20 years, so I know that I have a good team that I can rely on to build a vision together. Um, that being said, we are a university teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, at the McGill University, we are, uh, you know, a, a university um, department. Uh, and I think it's our duty to be leaders in terms of leading new knowledge, but also transmitting knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why events like today are great, because it allows us also to, to transmit some knowledge. And you know, if people come away uh, hearing Howard say, please don't smoke THC, and, and we get a few kids that don't, then maybe we've, you know, we've, we've had, and if we have a few people um, if, the, if the minister hears us and, and starts opening the gyms and opening the arenas so that we can all get back to exercising, you know, that maybe we can influence things. I think as a university teaching hospital, we have that duty to make new knowledge, but also to share new knowledge and to influence policy within our, our province. I really think that if we're properly positioned, we can be an ear that the Minister of Health can listen to in terms of um, in terms of mental health policy for the province. Yeah, and uh, communicating, uh, uh, you know, th those changes that need to happen. We've kind of seen that a lot through COVID, uh, the MUHG also becoming uh, a voice through its experts as well and, and doing a, a good job with that. So, je, 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 big picture too, though. <laughs> Getting, touching back on, on, on what Dr. Margulies was saying, you know, about um, things that are within our control for, mm -hmm. for people who are listening. Um, you know, is there a shift in the way that, uh, that we view mental health that needs to change, uh, perhaps in terms of people becoming more responsible for their, um, for their own mental health. And you know, we are talking about it a lot right now. So do you see yeah. that shift happening? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've talked a lot about with COVID, with COVID, with COVID, but I think a lot of things have happened pre-COVID um, that as a society, we have gone through changes that maybe are not conducive to our mental health. Um, I'm going to take the example of technologies for a second. Um, screen time has been associated negatively with exercise time, negatively with sleep time, and negatively with face-to-face -face time. So what that means is the more time you spend on your screen, the less time you spend face-to-face -face actually interacting with people, the worse your sleep is, and the less exercise you get. We know that exercise and sleep and face-to-face -face connections are all protective for mental health. So this is just one example of how our society has shifted away from behaviors that might be helpful to maintain our mental health. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's happened with technology is this idea of the instantaneous and I always have to be answering and I always have to be worrying about, I have to worry about what my, my Instagram feed says, I have to worry about answering that text, I have to be always available and that has taken away the time to have idle brain to be able to, to dream, to be able to think, to be creative, or to just have the brain at rest. Okay? The, the number of times that you, know, you, you might be in the grocery store lineup and everybody in the lineup is checking their phone, right? So there's no, even if you have to wait five minutes at the cash, there's no downtime for your brain. You, you're stimulating it all the time. We're all using technology and nobody's really studied how technology is affecting our brains. But what we have been seeing, and this is pre-COVID, the levels of anxiety in our youth are going up, the levels of eating disorders in our youth are going up, um, the levels of ADHD are going up. Mm -hmm. So at some point, we're gonna have to, as a society, take a step back and look at what we're collectively doing that's making us all more distressed. And, and P en, en français, il y a, a, a peut-être aussi une éducation à faire en amont. Là, on parle de, de prévention, de différentes choses qu'on peut peut-être 
euh, ça n'éliminera pas, éliminera pas euh, ça ne va pas éliminer la, la santé, euh, les problèmes de santé mentale, mais peut-être qu'on peut prévenir certains épisodes, euh, certaines conditions. Euh, puis ouais. Ça commence très jeune. Là, euh, C'est oui. sûr, si on éduque les gens, par exemple, à utiliser les, 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 la technologie et les réseaux sociaux de façon plus responsable, mais aussi si on éduque les enfants à la gestion émotive. Mmh. Le mmh. nombre d'adultes que j'ai dans mon bureau qui ne sont pas capables de nommer les quatre émotions de base. Hein. <rire> Puis là, pour ceux qui se questionneraient oh, ou qui quoi? se disent mmh, « c'est quoi? » Donc, la colère, la tristesse, la peur, la joie. Mmh. Mmh. On peut après ça rajouter la honte puis la culpabilité si on veut en avoir six. Mais, mais juste d'être capable d'articuler ces quatre émotions-là, d'être connecté sur ces émotions puis d'être capable de dire « ah, c'est ça que je ressens. Puis après ça, d'être capable de se gérer pour ne mm -hmm. pas être toujours en réaction à mon émotion. Je peux être en colère, ça ne veut pas dire que je suis obligée de casser la table. La colère, c'est une émotion qui me dit quelque chose par rapport à ce que je suis en train de vivre. Et si je suis capable de la reconnaître et ensuite de décoder ce qu'elle me dit sur mon environnement et sur ma situation, bien là, je suis en meilleure position d'agir sur mon environnement pour améliorer les choses. Donc, une éducation à la santé mentale dans les écoles, ce n'est pas la première fois que j'en parle, je n'arrêterai pas d'en parler jusqu'à temps que ça se fasse, euh, mais je pense que c'est crucial si on veut éliminer ou, ou réduire la quantité de, de troubles anxieux et de troubles dépressifs. Vous savez, 70 des troubles mentaux se développent avant l'âge de 25 ans. Donc, mm -hmm. si on veut vraiment faire quelque chose, il faut agir jeune, mm -hmm. il faut équiper notre jeunesse pour être capable de se gérer mieux. On doit aussi éduquer nos jeunes que, que c'est normal d'avoir ces émotions-là, ouais. toutes les émotions. Ouais. Mm -hmm. et, et si vous êtes anxieuse pour un certain temps, ça ne veut pas dire que vous avez un trouble anxieux. Ouais. Ou si vous êtes triste, ça ne veut, ça veut dire pas que vous êtes en dépression. Non, ça. Si ton chum te laisse, tu as le droit d'être triste, puis si tu n'as pas étudié pour ton examen de français, tu as le droit d'être anxieux. Ouais. Oui. <rire> si ça fait ouais. un mois qui fait moins 30, puis euh, on n'a pas vu ouais. <rire> mais, mais je vous vois, euh, Marise Godin aussi, euh, hocher de la tête. Euh, oui, vous, ça, ça affecte ouais. ce que vous voyez aussi, là, oh, euh, au jour le jour. Oui, tout à fait. On, on voit de plus en plus, puis c'est vrai qu'on voit de plus en plus de jeunes qui ne savent pas comment s'autogérer, qui ne savent pas quoi faire avec les émotions qu'ils ont. Euh, puis une partie de ça, c'est la technologie, mais l'autre chose aussi, puis le face-à-face -face dont, dont tu vas parler, les gens sont incapables de se parler. Il euh, n'y a pas moyen d'avoir un débat. <rire> ça monte rapidement à des arguments. Et, y, cette intolérance à « non, non, je veux ma réponse maintenant, je l'avais tout de suite, il faut que ça soit tout cuit, il faut que ça soit… » Il ne peut pas y avoir de zone grise, j'ai besoin d'une réponse, c'est noir ou c'est blanc. Euh, de la même façon que ça me prend une réponse tout de suite sur mon texto, les jeunes ont de la difficulté avec ça. Et, et je suis d'accord avec toi, on ne l'enseigne pas assez. On leur, on leur enseigne l'importance d'aller courir, de faire du sport, parce que c'est bon pour leur santé mentale, mais on n'apprend plus aux jeunes à, à tolérer la société. Mm -hmm. euh, on le voit dans nos familles, les familles sont beaucoup plus petites, c'est facile de, que, que, que le jeune n'ait qu'à gérer ses propres émotions, très peu les émotions de ses frères et sœurs parce qu'il y en a de moins en moins, et, et, et peut-être les parents, mais encore une fois, ça devient conflictuel rapidement. Alors, de, de sortir le jeune de, de ce cercle vicieux de « j'ai des émotions, j'essaie de, 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 de les éviter le plus possible » ou « je réagis à mon émotion », euh, on n'enseigne pas ça aux jeunes. Mm. Et, et je pense qu'il y en a beaucoup qui, qui, qui consultent parce qu'ils ne savent plus quoi faire avec leurs émotions. Mais avant, de, avant de passer aux questions des participants, je vais, je vais quand même aller une bonne nouvelle. <rire> parce qu'évidemment, on a besoin d'éducation, euh, recherche, innovation, mieux comprendre euh, les problèmes de, de santé mentale, puis aussi mieux s'occuper en amont de, mm. de sa santé mentale. Mais euh, la bonne nouvelle, c'est qu'à l'automne dernier, il y a trois grands donateurs euh, qui se sont unis pour euh, doubler les dons reçus en santé mentale. So, uh, to, to name them, the Rossi Foundation, the Hewitt Foundation, and uh, Senator David Angus, thank you very much for uh, your support. And uh, c'est une campagne de dons doublés qui a permis à la Fondation de l'Hôpital Général, Général de, de Montréal de récolter un total de 1,25 million de dollars. Donc, c'est... Ça va aller vers toutes les, euh, les mm -hmm. initiatives dont on parle. Euh, le MGH Center for Precision Psychiatry, um, The Avatar Project, The Music Therapy Program, The Program for First Episode Psycho Psychosis that Dr. Margulies has been uh, talking about, and uh, renovations at the Allen Memorial. So um, those funds going to those uh, initiatives 
very important initiatives. So um, I, I, I want to ask you guys, um, you know, to you, what is the importance of philanthropy in in, in supporting your different missions? Um, you know, you obviously funded by the government, but then philanthropy has its role to play in an important one. So uh, I'm not sure who wants to go first. <laughs> How's it affected you directly? Yeah, it, we have almost all our programs are supported in one way or the other by by foundation by the foundation, and and we would not be able to have uh, the initiatives that we've been able to put together without that. And so it's been precious. Uh, I know the government is investing more and more in mental health, but uh, but mm -hmm. it's not sufficient. And and. Um, I think we've been able to have a wonderful relationship with the foundation and, and really target where do we need the help. Uh, and we've had a wonderful ear. <laughs> uh, and, and we've been able to, you mentioned several of the programs we have, but the foundation also supports many of uh, salaries of, of psychologists mm -hmm. and social workers and, and a variety of other um, that we would not be able to have otherwise. And so it strengthens our teams. It allows us to do more. Uh, it allows us to do more innovative stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't do the work we do without them. I want to yeah, specifically but, mention yeah. the RBC Foundation yeah. because uh, they specifically uh, give a, a large grant to the PEP program, my, my program, which has helped us to um, do some quite uh, innovative projects. Um, it allowed us to uh, have a psychologist on the team. It allowed us to revamp our website to get, have better outreach and to do some innovative uh, developments and programming for our, for our youth. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so it's, it's partnerships like that through the help of the MGH Foundation and large corporations that can allow us to uh, better the mental health of our youth and, uh, and we hope to see many more uh, corporations and large donors uh, be, jump on board and, and really see mental health as as important as physical health in, in donating and giving. Because, you know, when I, when I started my career some 20 years ago, you never had uh, mental health awareness and mental health donations. And now it's becoming uh, much more common, and I hope it's going to become no, the norm in the future. I think people. I think, so. <laughs> I think people have understood how important mental health is and how prevalent mental illness is. Uh, you know, when we say one in five people will be affected with mental illness in their lifetime, so everybody knows somebody who's been affected. Um, where I think we had difficulty is, you know, most of our treatments are human treatments. They inc they involve time and they involve people. So. You know, we don't need fancy machines, we don't need fancy equipment, uh, our medications are generally not the most expensive in terms of if you compare them to other branches of medicine. Um, so the foundation money and, and the grants we receive often goes to hiring humans to treat humans because the bottom line is no matter how much you know, we can use technology to improve certain access or, or, or certain pathways, a lot of our treatments are people treating people. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, that's where a lot of our money goes. And I think people have started to understand that, that you can't, you can't get away with not having professionals to treat mm -hmm. for mental illness. And, and you know, on that, on that note, I'm curious to know, you know with, uh, with the ability now to do you know, all kinds of things on Zoom and, and, and seeing patients virtually now, has that? taken away the need for technology, I'm guessing, has not replaced the people. No, no. Uh, has it changed anything in your ability to reach more people or to, or to treat them better? I mean, for certain clientele, it allows people to be seen without having to leave work, for instance. Mm -hmm. So for certain populations um, you know, who are already very computer literate and who are fortunate enough to have a computer screen and Wi-Fi and, and a camera and TV, a uh, camera and, and sound, you know, they can actually, we can actually do some of that. So I, during pandemic, I've, you know, seen patients from across the province who prior to pandemic would have driven down to Montreal to see me. Okay. But that's one segment of our population. Our pop, you know, we have other segments of our population who are either too old or too cognitively challenged or too poor to connect mm -hmm. virtually, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the bottom line is, 
if you spend your whole day on Zoom, it's not the same thing mm -hmm. as being face to face. I mean, it's lovely here. There's four of us in a room. It's exciting, <laughs> right? It's like, you know, <laughs> the highlight of my week by far. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to, to go to a couple of questions from, uh, from people who are watching us who either send them ahead of time or, or, or are, are asking them now. Um, I want to see, first of all, what do we have? Um, so, so let's, let's, I thought this was interesting, uh, Dr. Margulies, because it's something that we, we've spoken about before. Uh, so in Ontario, there are these youth wellness hubs. So that's a really cool thing uh, that are integrated and they're designed to streamline mental health services for youth. Uh, and, and the question is, do you have something similar in Quebec? Is this in the works or is this something that you hope to see that could be useful? So actually the Quebec government has uh, started to uh, look at this very entity. Uh, in Quebec it's called Air Ouverte. And what Air Ouverte is, is like, uh, uh, now there's a, there's a number of them. They're embedded in CLSCs right now, so it's not necessarily the best location for them. Um, but what they are is are access points for people who are experiencing a number of different problems that youth would experience. And we're targeting the 12 to 25 uh, age range, which is the right age range to target. So they could be experiencing bullying at school. They could be experiencing, you know, uh, issues with uh, their families, friends, social issues, uh, uh, you know, uh, any number of sexuality, of sexuality issues, contraception, yeah, all kinds of health issues that they may be facing. And when there are more serious or more concerning mental health concerns, then when, they're, when they are seen in these hubs, they would then be directed to the appropriate services. This was actually based, this, is, this concept is actually was born in Australia um, by, a, by a number of people uh, headed by Sir Patrick McGorry, who started what's called uh, the Headspace Clinics in Australia, which are a very similar concept. And these are now being you know, promoted worldwide. And it's, it's nice to see that Canada is actually at the forefront of some of these clinics. So Quebec is on the map and they are thinking about this. Um, and, and we hope to see more of these access points and clinics like this in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and would make your job easier, I'm guessing too. Maybe people referred slightly earlier to you and, or, 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 or directed to the right place perhaps. We, we hope that what it will do is destigmatize mental illness among the youth and allow them to access services mm -hmm. sooner. Exactly mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah. And educate them as well as your time Yeah. Is yeah. Um, uh, Marie's Godin, uh, what role do you play in supporting hospitalized patients once they leave in terms of follow-up care? Peut-être qu'on peut répondre en français. Le, mm -hmm. le, le rôle que, que vous jouez à l'hôpital, les intervenants à l'hôpital, une fois qu'un mm -hmm. patient qui a été hospitalisé est prêt à quitter. Mm -hmm. Les patients qui sont hospitalisés chez nous sont pris en charge euh, en clinique externe après. On a aussi un programme de jour de, qui est un programme de transition qui les aide à passer là, de la phase aiguë hospitalière euh, jusqu'à temps qu'ils soient assez autonomes pour, pour s'occuper d'eux-mêmes et tenir à leur rendez-vous en, en externe. Euh, et, et ça, c'est une équipe, encore une fois, multidisciplinaire qui s'occupe euh, de ces patients-là. Euh, différents diagnostics ont différentes trajectoires, euh, sont dirigés vers différentes cliniques externes. Euh, mais je dois dire, puis je suis contente de dire ça au CUSUM, je ne peux pas parler pour le reste de, du réseau, mais au CUSUM, on, on, on fait du beau travail à suivre notre clientèle, s'assurer que les gens ne tombent pas entre les cracks. Euh, mm -hmm. on, on fait des suivis rapprochés. Euh, une fois qu'on a eu un épisode aigu, euh, qui habituellement, c'est des gens qui entrent par l'urgence, qui, qui sont vraiment euh, en, en, en situation de crise avec leur, leur maladie mentale, euh, une fois pris en charge, ils sont bien suivis. Euh, je sais que dans le réseau, il y a des gens qui se plaignent que la, la prise en charge est difficile, mais une fois que la prise en charge est faite, les patients les plus malades sont bien suivis. Mm -hmm. euh, et, et ça, ça prend toute une équipe, ça prend un continuum de soins aussi, ça prend une trajectoire. Alors, on essaie de garder à l'interne les gens sur l'unité de psychiatrie, les gens le moins longtemps possible, pour justement qu'on puisse les transitionner le plus rapidement possible vers une vie plus normale et, et les soutenir pour, pour qu'ils se prennent en charge, pour qu'ils prennent leur santé en, en, en charge. Et okay, puis comment vous voyez l'évolution de, de ça? Comme vers quoi on s'en va avec euh, la, la, la prise en charge, etc.? Oui. <rire> des grosses questions! Des grosses questions. Mmh. Sortez votre boule de cristal! Oui. <rire> <rire> euh, C'est là que ça nous prend nos partenaires de réseau. Euh, parce qu'il y a des choses... La, la mission du cuisine, c'est vraiment des programmes académiques et des cliniques euh, des, ou des programmes spécialisés. On, on a besoin d'être de, de, capable d'avoir... Euh, 
des meilleurs rapports ou des, des trajectoires plus simples avec ce qu'on appelle la première ligne, là, les services de proximité dans la communauté. On, on a notre territoire, mais on dessert des, des patients qui viennent de partout dans la province, dans certains programmes. Alors, on, on doit être capable de faire ce qu'on a besoin de faire comme service spécialisé, puis ensuite passer le bâton, si vous me permettez l'expression, à quelqu'un dans la communauté qui, qui, qui est plus près du patient, d'où il travaille, d'où il vit. Euh, et, et ça, on a encore du travail à faire à ça, mais, mais on a des belles collaborations avec nos partenaires. Alors, Puis, ça, je suis contente. Mais il y a quelqu'un qui nous écoute qui, euh, qui se demande aussi, euh, « Do you have family uh, peer support, I guess? Do you have support services for families as well? Um, » we, we do, we did. Um, that's one that COVID has affected a lot. Uh, we had a partnership with Ami Québec um, and, and with various other community Uh, services that help support the patient as much as, as the family, because the family is so important. Uh, but it's been difficult during COVID because people cannot visit. People, uh, you know, there's, there's no group work. There, you cannot go into somebody else's home. And so that's been more difficult. So I'm really hoping that as we get out of this pandemic, uh, we can resume some of those partnerships. But that person was asking us about peer support workers, so I just want to mention that we mm. do have a peer support yes, uh, program mm -hmm. at the at the MUHC called the Recovery Transition Program, which is a uh, which is a, a way of someone who has lived experience, which is super important, yeah. to be able to both themselves give back and then for the patient and the families to. Uh, better understand from a person who has lived experience what the trajectory is for them and and to better um, support them in the, in through their mental health uh, through the, and well and mental wellness eventually as well is, um, is that a, is that a relatively new concept or idea to to have that to have people have gone through those experiences of pairing them it's certainly newer um, mm -hmm. and it's certainly something that um, The RTP, we call it the RTP program, Recovery Transition Program. It's, it's a newer program within the MUHC, um, and it is... Uh, and it is Newer, but it's still already five years still old yeah. or so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it's not, it's new. not <laughs> <laughs> It's relatively new. Yeah. It just seems newer. like a new concept as an outsider. Mm -hmm. It's to, a to concept that, that's pretty much permeated the whole réseau de la santé. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's something that's recognized even at the ministerial level mm -hmm. as important. Des patients partenaires, we see mm -hmm. them a little bit everywhere. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to families because I think there's two, there's two things I wanted to add about families. Um, in some clinics, we do actually have uh, groups for families. I know in our clinic, because we serve a lot of really uh, of youth, uh, we actually have a group specifically for parents of these youth that we see. Um, but I want to mention that there's community organizations across the province. So Ami Quebec is, is the English one. Um, but there's la, la, le réseau avant de craquer. I was okay. going to say la fondation de la, de, 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 des parents et amis de malades mentaux, but they changed their name. They're now la, la réseau avant de craquer. Um, there are these, these uh, community organizations to support families and parents of people with severe and persistent mental illness across the province. And so if the question was related to that, I would encourage our listeners to look up réseau avant de craquer. Um, I think a lot they're of great partners. Maybe at this breaking point, um, you know, another question that we got um, was what steps can we take to actively remove the stigma um, around mental health treatment? Is that, I, I feel I mean, like it some feels of like it's, we're doing that now, like we're doing right? That, right. I mean, one of the only, you know, silver linings of COVID is that we're like, we're addressing this now, right? Yeah, I mean, I, even before though, even, mm -hmm. even with some initiatives, like, you know, think of Bell Let's Talk, for instance, or, you know, some I, high profile yeah. initiatives, but yeah. what, what, you know, how can we continue to do that or accelerate it from your perspective? I, <laughs> I can, I can <laughs> sense many nice. wants to Where jump in on this know, one. Even before COVID, you mentioned Bell Let's Talk, but um, I, I think people in influencing position in leadership position, talking about their own experience. Uh, it's, it's been fascinating to watch athletes more recently come out and say, I, you know, I was on top of the world, but I was so struggling inside. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and, and there's, there's been politicians, there's been all kinds of people that have come out and said, no, I've had to deal with mental illness. And I think that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. So this perception that these very tough people who have it all were on top of the world, Um, still suffer from mental illness and had to seek help. Uh, I think that goes a long way to, to help people. I know lots of people who decided to consult because 
their hero or their, uh, you know, this person they value on TV or in the media or wherever um, has admitted to be to, to needing help and, and seeking help. Mm -hmm. um, it, but gives, I, I it gives a, so much more work to It be gives done. a message d'espoir yes. too, right? Yes. Because if you see all these very successful people mm -hmm. saying, I have an anxiety disorder and I've treated it and yet yeah. I can still you know, be on TV or mm -hmm. I have a, you know, a substance abuse disorder and I'm treating it and I can still go back to playing my professional sport or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, I think it gives, it gives hope too. It says mental illness is not, doesn't mean your life is over. Yes. Mm -hmm. It humanizes the experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to what you were saying about um, you know the the institution's role to 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 communicate this and to to sort of transfer this mm -hmm. knowledge as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us at home, for taking the time uh, to to listen to this uh, conversation, be part of this uh, conversation. Um, and if you wish to contribute to the mental health mission and uh, be part of redefining and innovating in mental health, you can make a donation to the Montreal General Hospital Foundation through uh, their website, codelife.ca, codevi.ca. Or for more on the hospital's extraordinary history uh, and uh, obviously how uh, it ties uh, to, uh, to the history of Montreal, there's a great website. I've been talking about it for the last three, uh, <laughs> three interviews, the three editions of this, but uh, you can visit, visit um, mga200.com and you'll find out more about the mental health mission as well. And we will see you next month for installment number five of the Code Life interviews. I will see you then. Thank you so much and have a great evening.